In today's video, we will discuss the resultant of the unbalanced forces along with Newton's second and third laws of motion. Newton's second law of motion. To understand Newton's second law, we need to first understand what an unbalanced force is. Looking at the following examples, if you sit in a wheeled chair and ask your friend to push you along the hall, then the following two things happen. One, if the push from your friend is stronger than the friction between the chair and the floor, then the chair starts to move in the direction of push. Two, when the push is removed, then the force acting on the chair is only the friction, which will decelerate the chair and the chair will eventually come to a stop. If the resultant force acting on an object is not zero, we say the forces are unbalanced. With this example, we learn that when there is a resultant force acting on an object, the object will accelerate in the direction of the resultant force. Newton's second law of motion describes the relationship between them as the resultant force, or F in Newton, is equal to the mass, or m, in kilogram times the acceleration of an object, or a, in meter per second squared. With this law, we can also infer that a, resultant force of an object produces an acceleration. b, acceleration is directly proportional to force. That means doubling the force on the same mass will double the acceleration. c, with the same resultant force, f, doubling the mass, m, will half the acceleration, a. Newton's third law of motion. This law states that if body A exerts a force on body B, then body B will exert an equal and opposite force on body A. Thus, for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction, and they act on mutually opposite bodies. This law can be understood with the following examples. When someone pushes an object, he will feel some force on his hand, as if the object is pushing him back. If a book is placed on a table, the book's weight, or the gravitational pull of the earth on the book, is acting downward. At the same time, the table's reaction force, or the normal force, acts upwards with the same magnitude. Hence, the book remains stationary, not falling to the earth. Newton's third law of motion tells us four characteristics of forces. 1. Forces always occur in pairs. Each pair is made up of an action and a reaction. 2. Action and reaction are equal in magnitude. 3. Action and reaction act in opposite directions. 4. Action and reaction act on mutually opposite bodies. Have you watched the video on Newton's first law and the concept of inertia? Find out more in our channel. What is friction and its effects? Now we will discuss what friction is, what are some of its effects, and how we are using it positively. Friction comes into effect when two bodies are in contact. The friction force opposes or tends to oppose motion between surfaces in contact. For example, if a force is applied to a table to move it across the room towards the right, the friction will be towards the left. If the pushing force is greater than the friction, then the table will move. If the applied force is removed, friction will cause the movement of the table to slow down and eventually stop it. If the pushing force is smaller than the friction, the table will not move at all. How does friction affect us? The effects of friction can be positive or negative. Some of its positive effects are that we can walk without slipping. In motion, vehicles can slow down when needed. Some of its negative effects are that cars are 20% less efficient and in turn, moving parts in engines, motors and machines suffer wear and tear. So you may wonder how the negative effects of friction can be reduced. The answer lies in the invention and the discovery of wheels, ball bearings, lubricants, polished surfaces, and air cushions. Let's discuss them. Wheels. We cannot imagine pushing a shopping trolley that does not have wheels. We would need to exert a great deal of force to overcome the large friction between the metal basket and the floor. Being circular in shape, wheels reduce the friction between the basket and the floor, and smaller force can be applied to move the trolley. Ball bearings. Ball bearings are used to reduce friction between moving parts of cars, machines, and inline skates. Placed between moving parts, ball bearings roll around and prevent moving parts from rubbing against each other. This reduces the wear and tear of these parts. Lubricants and polished surfaces. Applying a layer of lubricant, such as oil or grease, between surfaces in contact can greatly reduce friction. Lubricants are frequently used between the moving parts of an engine to reduce wear and tear. This helps prolong the life of the engine. Polishing a surface removes surface irregularities. This reduces friction between surfaces in contact. Air cushion. 
we can ride a hovercraft over the ground and water and nearly any kind of surface. Do you know why? The hovercraft has a set of fans that blows air downwards continuously, creating a cushion of air that lifts the deck and minimizing the friction between the hovercraft and its terrain. In today's world, we are making use of everything for the benefit of mankind. So, how are we using friction to benefit us? Treads. Ever noticed a network of lines on tires? These are treads. Friction is important to the motion of vehicles. Friction enables the tire to grip the road surface and roll without slipping. Without friction, a car's wheels would just skid on their place or move without control. On a rainy day, a moving vehicle may skid on wet roads. Its tires need to have more grip on the road to prevent skidding. This is why tires are designed with tread, grooves that quickly channel water out from underneath the tires. This improves the grip of the tires on wet roads. Parachute. Air resistance is a type of friction in the air. A skydiver in mid-air varies air resistance to change his speed. To speed up, he reduces air resistance by adopting the head-first position. To slow down, he increases air resistance by adopting a spread-eagle position. To achieve a safe landing, a skydiver has to increase air resistance significantly. He does this by making use of the much larger surface area of an open parachute. Chalk. Rock climbers need to have a firm grip on the rock surface with their hands and feet. They usually use chalk powder on their hands to absorb perspiration and improve their grip. Musk Melon Company is introducing its new prototype of a super-fast transportation system, and it currently opens a recruitment for volunteers to join the system testing for thousands of dollars of incentives. So, do you want to participate in the trial run? Well, it does seem like it's too good to be true, and you're mostly correct. The catch is, the high-speed transportation will be run in a looping track, or a circular motion reaching 300 km per hour in one second. But what is circular motion? An object is in circular motion when it travels in a circular path. Imagine a Texan cowboy ties a hook of uniform mass density at the end of the rope and keeps the other end of it in his hand. The rotation he makes with the hook while holding the string makes the hook move in a circular path. The motion of the hook will be called circular motion. One of the important aspects in this motion is velocity. Remember that velocity is defined by speed and direction. In uniform circular motion, the speed will be consistent while the direction changes. But in non-uniform circular motion, both speed and direction changes. So, what keeps the hook moving in a circular instead of a linear path? Based on Newton's law of inertia, an object will move in a straight path unless there is an external net force acting on it. In circular motion, the force comes in the form of centripetal force. It keeps the body moving and accelerating in a circle with inward direction. When the moon revolves around the Earth, the gravitational force between them provides the necessary centripetal force. It is similar to the revolution of planets around the Sun. And when our cowboy rotates his rope with hook attached, the required centripetal force is provided by the tension of the rope. If the hook of mass, m, moves with constant speed, v, in a circle of radius, r, then centripetal acceleration, a, produced by the centripetal force, fc, is given by ac equals v squared over r. According to Newton's second law of motion, the centripetal force, fc, is given by mass times centripetal acceleration, fc equals mac. So, the equation can be rearranged like this. Fc equals mv squared over r. This equation shows that the centripetal force acting on a body that moves in a circle depends on the mass, m, of the body, square of its velocity, v, and reciprocal to the radius, r, of the circle. You must have heard of centrifugal force before and maybe occasionally confuse it with the centripetal force. Well, let's just say the centrifugal force is a pseudo-force with outward direction. The force is only applied to you when you are in a non-inertia frame of reference. When you are observing any circular motion, you can only figure the inward force holding the moving object close. That will be different if you are moving along with the object in a circular motion. As you are a non-inertial observer, you will feel like being pushed outward, having some kind of falling sensation to the sides. So, is a centrifugal force a real force, or just a sensation? For now, 
it's enough to know that the force exists only on a specific frame of reference. Thank you for your continuous support, especially our valued patrons and members who have been encouraging us to keep producing more quality content.